Good evening. In this video, we're going to ask the question, do Federation citizens in Star Trek earn a paycheck? This video is covered under fair use and is allowed for the purposes of criticism, news reporting, teaching, parody, which doesn't infringe on copyright 17 USC 107. So, the question is, do Federation citizens actually earn a paycheck? Now, in this video, I want to establish three things. I want to establish, A, that there's a currency being used in the Federation. B, I want to establish the fact that Federation citizens do actually earn a paycheck. And, most importantly of all, the whole crux of the argument is, do they spend it on goods and services inside the Federation among themselves as Federation citizens? In other words, does one Federation citizen pay another Federation citizen inside the Federation to provide goods and services? That's my argument. That's what we're leading up to in this whole thing. As always, I'm using Alpha Canon only. That is to say, what we see in the TV shows and in the movies. I'm not using Memory Alpha. I'm not using Memory Beta. I'm not using any books or tech manuals. So please do not argue with me about things that are not seen on, on screen. If you do, I'm just going to say, that's not canonical, which is true. It's not canonical. So, one of the first mentions of the economy being different in the Federation is in the episode, The Neutral Zone. And again, I'm not an expert on money or currency. I do have a little bit of an education in engineering economy, uh, but that's about it. So, uh, please... Please, if I ever give you financial advice, just ignore it, okay? Because I am not a financial expert. However, in this scene, we have Captain Picard meeting a 20th century financier, Ralph Oppenhaus, who is supposedly an expert on money. And he has made the leap from the 20th century to the 24th century by being frozen after his death, along with two other people. And they are found, and they are cured, and they are brought back to life. So this scene, a lot of people think Picard says there is no, uh, the nobody gets paid. And that's just not true either. In this scene, Picard says the following. People are no longer obsessed with the accumulation of things. We've eliminated hunger, want, the need for possessions. He doesn't say nobody's getting paid. So uh, if you think that's what he says here, it's not what he says. Later on, however, he does establish, it is established at the end of the episode by Ralph that there is no money that his office is gone, what will he do, how will he live? And Picard says, this is the 24th century, material needs no longer exist. Okay, again, I'm not arguing the fact that there is no money. It's clearly stated there's no money. But what I am arguing is there is some form of currency and that form of currency is called the Federation Credit. So I'm not arguing that there's no money because I'm not arguing that they have money. I, they don't have money. But currency and money are two separate things. And the currency that they use is called the Federation Credit. We see that in several episodes. Again, in Star Trek IV, 
Jillian asks, they don't use money in the 23rd century? And Kirk says, well, they don't. And so, yes, I agree. There is no such thing as money. But there is currency. And if you think about it, we're going towards a paperless currency already in this 21st century where your bills can be paid automatically, your paycheck can be, de can be um, deposited automatically. You're not paying attention to your money the way that we used to pay attention to money, right? You're not having to physically get a check, take it to the bank, deposit it, or cash it, or whatever. You typically, if you're a, you know, if you're a middle class person or upper class person, you're not really paying a whole lot of attention to your money as much as you used to. So, in the movie First Contact, we also hear Lily asking some questions about the economics of the 24th century. And Picard says that the economics are somewhat different. But when she asks the pointed question of, you mean you don't get paid? Picard deflects. He doesn't say that he doesn't get paid. He says the acquisition of wealth is no longer the driving force in our lives, which is similar to what he said to Ralph Oppenhaus. And quite frankly, Picard is probably rich. He, own, he and his brother own a, a very successful vineyard. And one thing that rich people don't do, they don't talk about what kind of money they make. That's, that's actually in bad taste for, for the rich. So he's deflecting here. He's not, he's not saying, no, I don't get paid. He's saying something to basically divert the conversation from his paycheck. So in the next scene, in the next piece of evidence of people getting paid, we see we meet Harry Mudd in Mudd's Women. Harry is, how does he put it? Wifing settlers. That's how he puts it. His, he uses the unfortunate term that the women that he's transporting are his cargo. It would have been a less offensive if he had said they're his passengers, uh, but he is essentially providing a, the service of getting women to settlers for a paycheck. And he is a Federation citizen. Let's make no mistake about that. He is a Federation citizen. Kirk could not hold him if he wasn't a Federation citizen. He could not, Kirk could not charge him with unauthorized use of a vehicle if he was not a Federation citizen. He could not say that he was operating without a master's license if he weren't a Federation citizen. So Harry Mudd is an entrepreneur and he's trying to make some form of paycheck uh, as an entrepreneur. Later on in the episode, we learn that even though they're not going to where Harry Mudd promised, they're going to a planet of lithium miners. And he says, don't you understand? Lonely, isolated, overworked, rich lithium miners. So that's four people now, at least, who make money as Federation citizens. And we're going to establish the fact that these guys are Federation citizens who are working the mines, the lithium mines. Later on in the episode, we see Kirk being confronted by Ben Childress. And Ben Childress is the head of the mining consortium. He's like, you want lithium crystals? We've got them. 
And Kirk says, fine, I'm authorized to pay an equitable, an equitable price. So again, Kirk is paying for goods. That is not something that is done in a moneyless society. You actually are, he's actually been authorized to pay some amount of money for the lithium crystals that he needs to power his ship. Now, lithium becomes dilithium later on, uh, but in this episode, they're called lithium crystals. So how do we know that the miners are actually Federation citizens? Well, in the same scene, when Childress says, I've arranged to have mud um, freed of and charges dropped, Kirk says, no deal. You're way out in space, gentlemen. You'll need medical help, cargo runs, starship protection, and do you want to consider those facts too? And again, starship protection by its own by itself is the Federation protecting the miners. So the miners have to be Federation citizens. Otherwise, their own government would send starship protection, not, not the Federation. Their medical help is coming from the Federation. Their cargo runs are being arranged through the Federation. These three guys are Federation citizens. The next piece of evidence is from the devil in the dark. And here we see that we have a thing killing people, these miners. Again, they're miners. And 50 people have been killed already, and they're called, and the enterprise is called in to help figure out and kill whatever's killing the miners. By the end of the episode, we see that now, now that they figured out what the Horta is and that her kids are beginning to tunnel, that these guys are going to be embarrassingly rich as miners because they are, in fact, sitting on a, a gold mine, in a sense, of all these per GM deposits and selenium and all these other things that will make them embarrassingly rich. So now, again, these are Federation citizens. They wouldn't call the Federation for help if they weren't Federation citizens. And the fact that these guys are going to be embarrassingly rich means that they also earn some form of paycheck. So Federation citizens, we, we're, up to, we're up to at least 54. If we count the miners in the first shot, there's probably another 10. So that's 64 Federation citizens, including Kirk and Spock who are aware of people getting paid and getting and 54 of them are actually earning some form of currency for the goods and services that they are providing. Continuing on, we see in the episode Who Mourns for Adonais this scene where Chekhov has said something to, the, to Kirk to the effect of Apollo looked like he was tired or in pain. And Kirk says, Mr. Chekhov, I think you've earned your pay for the week. Now, again, some people will say, oh, this is just a euphemism. I don't think it's a euphemism. And I'm going to tell you why I don't think it's a euphemism in a minute. Um, but in this case, that's another four people who, by my count, we're now up to 68 people 
who earn paychecks. They, they absolutely do. They earn some form of currency. Uh, the currency is, again, the Federation credit. And that's 68 people by my count so far. And so we have this scene where people are, Kirk is expressly saying, you've earned your paycheck. Again, in the Doomsday Machine, we see that Kirk is on the constellation and it's a wrecked ship, but Scotty has managed to charge up a phaser bank and Kirk says to Scotty, you've just earned your pay for the week. Stand by, fire phasers. And they're up against the doomsday machine and Matt Decker is on the Enterprise at this point and they're both trying to fight the doomsday machine. So, again, I don't think this is a euphemism. I don't think it's just a turn of phrase. Scotty has actually earned money. Now, there's a scene later on where Scotty buys a boat and Kirk buys a house. Um, I can't remember what movies those are from, but they are. Oh, well, actually, Kirk buying the house is from Generations. Uh, I don't remember where Scotty buys a boat. That might be Star Trek V. But they're paying for goods and services. In the episode The Trouble with Tribbles, we go to Federation Space Station K7. And let's not mistake this as being anything else but a Federation Space Station. It's not just a random space station that somebody built and they're going there. This st space station is pretty specifically there for the development of Sherman's planet. And it's near the F Klingon territories, sure, but that doesn't mean that the people who work there are anything other than Federation citizens, including this guy, Cyrano Jones, who is a trader similar to Harry Mudd, a little bit more available, I think. Um, although Harry has his charms. Uh, but Cyrano Jones is a trader and he is a Federation citizen. Again, Kirk could not act against him if he weren't a Federation citizen. And Kirk does tell him to pick up every Tribble in the space station. And this is the real kicker. He, Cyrano Jones, is selling to the Federation barman, he doesn't have a name, um, Tribbles. And they haggle over the price of Tribbles. And so... The barman says, you're talking yourself out of a deal, friend. Six credits, not a credit more. Seven and a half, Jones replies. Seven? All right, you robber, six credits. The barman agrees. Done. When can I have them? Jones says, right away. Uhura then says, all right, what are you selling them for? And the barman says, well, let me see, little lady, six credits, figure a reasonable markup for a reasonable price, say 10%, 10 credits. <laughs> Which is funny because that's not 10% markup. <laughs> so this is the real kicker. We now see four Federation citizens, all of whom are buying things. Uhura, is, you know, the barman is haggling over the price of Tribbles. He's already bought Antarian Glow Water and some uh, Spike and Flame Gems, if, if I remember correctly, um, from Cyrano Jones. Those, those two guys, let's not make the mistake of saying they're not Federation citizens because they are. And the reason they're Federation citizens is because they're operating on a Federation space station. They wouldn't be allowed to operate on a space station if they weren't. Um, 
So they are Federation citizens dealing with Federation credits to buy and sell things. And Lieutenant Uhura is now willing to buy, with Federation credits, a triple. Of course, Cyrano Jones gives her his sample, and the barman is like, what are you trying to do, undercut the market? And Cyrano Jones says, once this little lady shows this beauty around, you'll be hip deep in customers or something. So, yeah, we have, this is the big thing, right? This right here cements the idea that Federation citizens pay for goods, goods and services to other Federation citizens in credits. And uh, there's no arguing this, this scene. There isn't. You, if you want to argue it, fine, but uh, I don't think you can. So, okay, maybe in the 23rd century they're still using Federation credits. Okay, maybe by the 24th century they're not. Maybe by the late 23rd century they're not. Um, so let's move into the 24th century and see if we can establish whether they're still using money or not. I've left out the scene um, where Beverly Crusher's at Farpoint Station buying a bolt of cloth because that is a scene wherein they are outside of the Federation. But in the episode Captain's Holiday, Picard has bought a Horgon. Now, this is one of the things that we're introduced to. Uh, we're introduced to Risa as a pleasure planet, and we're introduced to the Horgon, which is a fertility symbol. And he says, I just purchased it. Why are you implying it has some special meaning? And Joval, one of the Rysian women, says to own it is to call forth its power and to display it means that you want to seek Jamaharon, which is sex. Uh, so Picard doesn't realize what the Horgon is. Riker asked him to purchase it. And of course, that's the first thing he does is he buys the thing and then he's got it on his lounge chair next to him. And... So Picard is like embarrassed and finally convinces Joval that he doesn't want Jamaharon and then he covers it up. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of funny because he doesn't understand what that is. And he's an archaeologist, by the way. How does he not understand what a fertility symbol is? Uh, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. He's supposed to be, he's supposed to be this really good archaeologist and he, do, he doesn't know that the Horgon is a fertility symbol. Well... Uh, I mean, I guess he can't know everything, obviously, but it is kind of funny that he doesn't. So, now I guess I'm going to have to try to establish uh, whether or not Risa is a Federation planet, which I think I can do with some success. But before I do that, we also meet Vash. And Vash will talk about in a little while, because she is also a Federation citizen. And I will prove that here in a little bit. Um, in the meantime, Vash is the love interest for Picard in the episode Captain's Holiday. So now I'm going to try to convince you guys that Risa is actually a Federation planet. It's a pleasure planet, so people go there for vacation, and people from all over the place. Um, in the episode Deep Space Nine, um, the episode is Those Who Are Without Sin. We see Worf and Jadzia and Dr. Bashir and Lita and Quark all go on vacation to Risa. And they've just beamed down and they're all going their separate ways here. And I had to include that shot because, you know, Jadzia looks really good in this uh, swimsuit. 
So Worf is of course completely uncomfortable because he can't he can't find a way to relax most of the time, um, and he's kind of arguing with Dax and he says Risa is an artificial um, paradise uh, which is maintained by one of the most sophisticated weather control systems in the Federation. So in the Federation to me reads as yes, Risa is in the Federation. He goes on to say, in its natural state, Risa is nothing more than a rain-soaked, geologically unstable jungle. Sorry about the th fact that it got cut off. Um, at the end there, I was cutting and pasting, and I don't know why it does that um, in these really long sentences. It cuts it off even though I fit the whole thing to the screen. But the point is, the Federation weather control system in the Federation, RISA is in the Federation. To further cement the idea that it is in the Federation, we meet uh, Mr. Fullerton here, and he is the head of the uh, the I'm going to forget it now. Elementalist? No, that's not it. I'm forgetting what it's called now. Um, but he's the head of this um, conservative faction. And one of the things that he's trying to do, what they're trying to do, is restore the moral and cultural traditions of the Federation. This is, a, and he hands Worf the statement of their principles. And he says, if you'd like to hear more, we're holding a rally. And Worf goes, on Risa? And Fullerton says, what better place? The world revels in the kind of indulgence that's ending the fundamental, the foundations of the Federation. We intend to shut it down. So, again, if he's on some outward planet that's not part of the Federation it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for him to be there. It makes sense for him to be in a federate, on a Federation planet. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense for him to be not on a Federation planet trying to, you know, turn people back to the foundations and the cultural and moral traditions of the Federation. That would be like that, you know, it would be like if um, a televangelist went to uh, Tahiti and tried to convert Americans back to the, you know, American traditional values. How many, how many people are you going to, how many people are you, are you going to even have as a, as uh, as an audience that are actually Federation citizens. There's no guarantee. It would be more appropriate for Fullerton to be outside of DC or in Florida or San Diego or Hawaii, you know. That would make more sense. So anyway, getting back to Vash. Now Vash is a human. Uh, and she is also a Federation citizen. And she is, was a part of the Daystrom Institute, right? And here we see the conversation between Vash and Cisco. So now the Daystrom Institute is interested in me. That's ironic. Professor Wu seemed especially eager to speak to you again. Vash, did he really? I suppose he told you that he suspended my membership from the Institute's Archaeological Council. Cisco, on two occasions, something about the sale of illegal artifacts. Vash, well, when it comes to choosing between scientific uh, or profit, I choose profit. <laughs> so here we go. Vash is a Federation citizen. She's a part of the Archaeological Council of the Daystrom Institute. Again, she's human. She's 
obviously in the she's obviously a Federation citizen and she's making money. So Vash is another example. Now to as to the cow, I think that brings us up to what, seventy or so people who are making money. Um and they are earning a paycheck inside the Federation. Now, Vosh is on Deep Space Nine, and she's getting paid in Latinum. Okay, that's fine. Um, she, she can convert that Latinum to Federation credits anytime she wants to, obviously. It's, there's an exchange rate. We know that. We know that from the, uh, from the episode with the Barzan uh, wormhole. I forget the name of that. Uh, again, I, do, I don't include that. Um, in this because Barzan is not a part of the Federation uh, but Vash is part of the Federation and that's why I include her here even though she's getting paid in Latinum because she is a Federation citizen and she wants profit she's earning her paycheck essentially so she still wants to be rich so there are people in the 24th century who still want to be rich um, also, I didn't include Flint in this because I, even though I was reminded of it this morning, Flint in Requiem for Methuselah is rich enough in the 23rd century to actually buy a planet, and he is a Federation citizen. He comes directly from Earth. So, moving on. Here we have the episode, The Gift. And in this episode, Kess is leaving Voyager. And Janeway is going to make her goodbyes. And she sees Tuvok's meditation lamp. And again, this is a very strong evidence that Federation citizens pay something for goods and services to other Federation citizens because she says ah Tuvok's meditation lamp I was with him when he got it six years ago from a Vulcan master who doubled the price when he saw our Starfleet uniforms so again we have another two Federation citizens getting paid uh, or paying for something. So that brings up to, I'm going to say around, we were at 70. I forgot a couple of people in there. Like, like I probably forgot to count McCoy and in Who Mourns for Adonais and a couple of other people. Um, so I'm going to say we're around 75 people who get paid money, actual, well, not money, but currency, in the form of the Federation credit. So, this is my argument, guys. Federation citizens getting paid inside the Federation for goods and services. Now, one thing I'd like to comment on, too, is... As we look at this, we see a couple of things. One thing we see is capitalism is alive and well inside the Federation. It's not some socialist utopia necessarily. Um, there is some form of capitalism, otherwise people wouldn't get rich. And Something else that occurs to me about what Picard is saying is that while capitalism is still alive and kicking, consumerism is, isn't doing so well. And what I mean by consumerism, I mean rampant consumerism, where people have to have the next thing. They have to have the bigger car. They have to have the better TV. They have to have the latest clothing. They have to pay an arm and a leg for things that will make them temporarily happy 
but ultimately will not increase their long-term happiness. And I think that's what Picard is actually talking about. Again, this is me speculating. I think that what has happened is there's been a shift in the Federation towards a more Buddhist-like um, philosophy of life. Well, you know, Buddhists, they don't, they don't own a lot of things. They don't need to own a lot of things. That's not where their happiness is coming from, which in Western society, people try to get happiness by paying for it, by owning things that, again, superficially will make them happy for a short term. And I think that's the real issue here. I think that's where... Um, where this video um, is taking a message from Star Trek. It's that external things don't make you happy in the long term. They actually kind of make you miserable because I don't, I, you, know, you don't need an iPhone 12. You don't need um, a Galaxy flip phone or you don't need hundred and fifty dollar or two hundred and fifty dollar running shoes you don't need the Gucci bag you don't need it it's not going to make you happy in the long run the middle class are struggling to make ends meet but they're also trying to provide the latest they're trying to they're trying to own the latest and greatest of everything you don't need that I think that's the I think that's the real message here I think that's what Picard is saying the real message is of the 24th century economy. And so that's my takeaway. Anyway, um, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Uh, if you want to argue with me, please do so uh, in the comments section. If you really like the content, think about subscribing, hitting that like button, uh, sharing this video, hitting post notifications, all the buttony things that Google makes you do. I appreciate it. Um, and I think that's going to be it for me. Thank you so much. As always, special thanks to Trek Core for the images shown here.